The Talk Station is proud to present The War Files. The War Files, a selection of interviews honoring our warriors of the greatest generation, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Your name? John, John Duff. That's about it, I guess. They call me Jack. Where are you from, uh, Jack? Originally from New York. Uh, where were you at the outset of World War II? Uh, I was in Jersey living in my sister's home. And uh, I went in service from New Jersey. How old were you when it started? Uh, when the war started? Yes. Well, the war started actually in 1941. I went to service in 44. And I was 16, so what was I, 13? Wow, so you were 16 when you went into the Navy. I lied. <laughs> me, and my, me and the old man. <laughs> you really wanted to join? Yeah, I wanted to join because there were five of us who used to hang together in New York when I was going to high school. They used to call us the nuts because we used to like walnuts. And uh, the five of us wanted to go into service together, which we did. So you joined up in 44 in New Jersey. Where did you, where did you um, go to boot camp? I went to, uh, initially out to, out to Samson in, uh, off Lake Geneva. I don't even know if it's still in existence now. Then uh, I was in a unit which I didn't know at that time. I didn't find out until it was too late that I was being trained for the amphibious forces. So when I finished boot camp, I went down to Pendleton, down to Paris Island, mm -hmm. and I went through Marine Basic, and then from there I went to the Pacific. And what were you doing? Uh, you said you were in the amphibious uh, services. What 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 was your job? Well, aboard ship, I had I was a, a water tender, what they call a water tender. We used to run the boilers mm -hmm. on the ships, and then for combat duty, I was what they call a a bow hook on a landing craft. We used to have uh, LCPs, which we carried with us, and my job was up in the bow. The bow hook is um, actually a dis description of it is nothing more than a long polar hook on the end, and the idea was to grab the, the mooring lines that hung from the ship so you could bring them over and put them on the cleat on the landing craft. That was the fun job. All right, let's talk about your experience at boot camp here for a moment and uh, then on down to Paris Island. What was it like? Uh, we're now uh, in late 44 when, you f when you're going through boot camp? I went through 44. I went over it while well, I was overseas in, uh, let's see, Osman, August. I went July, early July I went over. So I went through boot camp in the winter time. Um, cold, <laughs> naturally it's cold, but uh, especially off Lake Geneva, there's always a good, nice breeze, right. solid breeze. Uh, but that was all right. I, I was young, I was young and stupid. Let's put it that way. Right, what what ship? Then you went aboard ship. What ship did you end up uh, serving aboard? I was assigned to the Comstock LSD-19. An LSD, LSD 19 Comstock. Right. And uh, you picked her up where? In, in California, I assume? I, I picked up the LSD uh, in Leyte. Oh, in Leyte? Yeah. So they flew you out to Leyte? We, I know. I went out on an APA out. A pro, right. Troop carrier. Troop carrier. Right. Um, all right, so you took, you left from California, California, and went to uh, Leyte. Right. Uh, when you came aboard the ship, what were you expecting to find? Yeah, we were hoping to be nice and peaceful and quiet because it was a nice, enjoy, enjoyable ride over. However, I found out it wasn't so peaceful and quiet. Uh, I was, went out to my assignment aboard ship as the water tender. Uh, I made my rank. I made my crow then. Uh, no, crow. people don't know crow, what a crow is. Crow is a third-class petty officer uh, in the engineering section. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we were out, I, I later found out that 
Uh, my assignment, secondary assignment, was to go ashore on the LCPs, which I did. All right, and where did you uh, end up going ashore? What what actions did you see? Uh, well, we invaded um, Okinawa, and uh, went, we t went out on the north side. Now, I you know, went down to the south to Naha, the capital, to take it. Uh, part of the, the rest of the unit went west, and it was a, a segment of our unit also went north, actually northwest. So they, they split up when we got ashore. Um, outside of Naha, I got hit. That's all. All right. Um, you were, uh, your job on the, uh, your secondary job was as a uh, bow hook, but you did, what did, when you were going ashore, what was it like? And of course, what, first off, what is an LPC? How large is it? A landing craft personnel. That's all we carried was personnel. How big was it? Oh, I don't, i tell you the truth, I don't honestly know. I don't think it was any more than 30 feet. It was made out of plywood. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a uh, motor Mac, and he had a secondary job. And uh, the coxswain, of course, did the steering, and he had a secondary job, so the same as I had as the bow hook. I had my bow hook secondary job was machine gunner. Okay, and where was the machine gun situated? In the bow. In the bow. All yeah. right, so you're, you're going into shore. Uh, now, so this is an LPC or LCP? LCP. LCP. Right. LCP. Um, how, many, how many Marines were on board? Um, we carried... I'm not mistaken, it was three squads. It was about 35 men, I believe. About 35 men. So you're now at the invasion of Okinawa. What was it like going ashore? No fun. Tell us, what, 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 how, did, how did it all transpire? How do you mean transpire? Well, I mean, did you do a holding pattern, and then when all the ships were prepared, you rushed ashore? We and went as in as, as the second wave, the first wave going in, and it got pretty well shot up. And then uh, we went in on as the second wave, and uh, we had our fun too. So our boat got hit, and when we LCPs got hit, we could, couldn't take them back out again because they had, looked like Swiss cheese. So they, we went ashore. That was our third, I guess, assignment to go ashore with the Marines, and, and he became then an infantryman. That's all. How long? So you went ashore with the Marines because your ship was hit, your boat was hit. Yeah. Um, how badly damaged was it before you came ashore? The 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 boat itself. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, I couldn't tell you how many holes were in. A lot of enough holes in it where you couldn't take it back out to the mothership. It wouldn't float. It would, you know, just sink. sink. It took to take too much water. So the a motor Mac who was actually in charge of the boat. And by the way, motor Mac, what is a motor Mac? A motor Mac was, he operated the motors itself in the boat itself. He was responsible for it. And he was the senior officer aboard he the boat? He was the senior, right. Right. The coxswain. Steered he, it. He steered the boat. He did the steering, right. And he was in the stern of the boat. The motor Mac was in the, right in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, the coxswain, his secondary, he carried a backpack radio for if we had to go ashore, the motor Mac carried a flamethrower if we had to go ashore. And I had Thompson if we had to go ashore. The Thompson machine gun. Right. Now you're a third class at this point. How much time had you had uh, actually firing that Thompson machine gun? And that's a 45 caliber, isn't it? That's 45 caliber, right. That's pretty heavy. Uh, I don't know. It was, I was just 16 years old. How heavy is heavy? You're 16 at this point. Yeah, yeah. All right, Jack. You you are going ashore on, on the second wave in the invasion of Okinawa. Mm -hmm. uh, you're getting shot at. Yeah. What's going through your mind? You don't want to know that. I was scared. Scared of hell. Uh, I got shrapnel hit some rocks in front of me and it broke them apart of course and all the rock pieces ended up in my legs and the witch knocked me on my tail of course but in the meantime I also picked up a slug in my in the, my gut and they knocked me down of course um, the medics 
came along after a little while, and they thought that I had more damage to my legs than anything else. They started concentrating on that, trying to get the piece of rock out of me, and then they discovered I had a hole in my gut. <laughs> and well, they forgot about the legs. Well, now, was this uh, after you had gotten ashore? Uh, after ashore, yeah. How 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 long after you got ashore did you get hit? Oh, maybe a day, day and a half. I'm not sure to be honest about it. All right. What were you hap What were you doing during that day prior to getting shot? You yeah. came ashore with the Marines. You're an inf infantryman at this point. You're carrying a Thompson submachine gun. Yeah, we were going into a, to the Naha to take over the capital. What was the fighting like? Oh, it was. A little bit wild as far as we were concerned. All right, I understand uh, I'm talking to guys after. that some sections, the resistance in Naha was not that great. But in our northern section, that's where the bulk of the Japanese troops were. And we ran into heavy resistance at that point. And uh, they did their job and we did ours. That's the only way I can put it. All right, now you got, you got shot well you first uh, uh i guess all of this happened simultaneously being hit by the shrapnel and also being hit by the uh the, uh, the just, bullet yeah i uh, didn't recognize the gut shot from my right side for a while because my legs hurt like holy hell but uh it was then that i found out that <laughs> i had a small hole in my belly <laughs> now was it were they medics or were they corpsmen that were treating you they were corpsmen corpsmen okay yeah they put me on a eventually on a litter and got me the heck out of there and I went back out on the landing craft. We didn't have the helicopters. Right. Uh, I went back out on the landing craft and they took me aboard the USS Hope, which the, was a hospital ship. The USS Hope? Yeah. Now, um, what was it like that for, for you there? Well, I was strictly medical. Uh, they were good. They, Patched me up here and there, we did all the necessary medical things. And uh, I stayed there for a while. How long? Do you remember? Roughly? Maybe three weeks. So maybe three weeks. What was, what was it like being uh, an injured sailor aboard a hospital ship? Because a hospital ship can't have a lot of amenities. What were, what were, were you living in a, in a, in a what, as we called it in the Navy, a rack? In a bunk? Or were yeah, you? Yeah, I was in a rack. Were you in the Navy? Yes. Well, you know what a rack is. I know what a rack is. I also, I also know what a water tender is. I, I know what water hours are. Oh, you do. <laughs> and, I, and I know that the best friends you can have on a ship are snipes because they're the ones who make sure that everybody has water. That's basically right. Yeah. No, I know from experience. But back to the, so you're, you're on the hospital ship. Well, what was it like for you? Because, again, I, I say that it wasn't... Well, actually, after you got through patching me up and I started to feel pretty good again, it was just a matter of hanging around, which I, I kind of objected to. <laughs> I didn't like the idea of just hanging around doing nothing. I spent more time in the rack than anyplace else. And just had you walk the deck if you were lucky enough. And that was it. It was the ship was out of the combat zone so it was, it was out on the water. So it really wasn't exposed to any combat. Did you have pretty much uh, free access to the ship? Um, well, <laughs> being a sneaky snipe, I went down below. Okay. I, I went to see whether the, uh, they had the same type of equipment as that we had on the LSD, which they did not. <laughs> I found out that their boilers were considerably larger, and uh, their engines were naturally larger than mm -hmm. what we had. But I made a few good acquaintances, and I introduced myself to their Joe Pot, which... Uh, to the what now? The Joe Coffee Pot. Oh, the Coffee Pot, Joe oh, Pot. We yeah. made it all, all made it the same way. It was nothing more than a big pitcher. Porcelain, I guess they call them. They have porcelain coated pitcher mm -hmm. with the little blue dots or white dots on a blue field. That wasn't a patriotic, that was just the way it was. Porcelain was. And you just, we just threw the grounds in there. And then we had a copper coil. Always came off the steam line. And the coffee pot. 
got hung on a hook with the cord, co coil inside, and the coil boiled the water. That made our coffee. What did you do with the coffee grounds? The coffee grounds were down the bilge, to be honest about it. But they went, you know. But we, not until we got at least three cups to out of them. What was the coffee like on board ship? Lousy. <laughs> Just plain lousy. <laughs> Any cream? Uh, no, no, no. We drank nothing but black coffee at that time. All right, you're... No sugar, either. You were aboard the Hope for three weeks, approximately three weeks, yeah. healing from uh, shrapnel wounds and a bullet. Mm -hmm. and then what happens to you? Well, I ended up being put on... I went back to the LSD. The Comstock. The Comstock. And we went to Tsingtao, China. And uh, the Japs were surrendering at that point. And we were going ashore with the Marines, too, to make sure that they did surrender, which they did. And they were loaded on APAs and taken back prisoners. And for us, it was kind of enjoyable there because the Chinese people really, um, I would say, enjoyed seeing us. Uh, they were no longer in Japanese control. They hated the Japanese. And uh, I imagine they were mistreated a great deal. When we came ashore, everything was, hey, you know, hi, Joe, good and good, good to see you, Joe, you know, right. the old thing. And I had my first introduction to fried eggs and steak. And don't ask me where the steak came from, because I haven't got the vaguest idea. <laughs> but we had that for breakfast. And that was just fantastic. And these Chinese women would cook for us. And it was just unbelievable. They were good cooks. And they had the largest damn eggs I have ever seen in my life. I know. I don't know where they were, where they got them from. I, don't know. Well, I never saw anything but chickens. I saw nothing but chicken, no ducks or anything like that, just chickens. But these eggs were tremendous. And I don't know how they got that. I didn't think a chicken could lay an egg that big, but I guess they did. But they were good. They, no, you, they, they might have been the worst thing in the world to eat, too. Uh, I don't know. All right, how long were you there? Now, where were you in China? Sing Tao. Sing Tao. Yeah, and that's, and, that's no longer called that. I don't know what it's called. How long, how long were you there? Oh, maybe a week and a half until we pulled out. Okay, and the, Ch and the Japanese were surrendering from, they, they'd been defeated at that Yeah, point. they were there right. as occupying forces, and when we went in, they surrendered. All right, what was it like aboard ship when you were living aboard ship? You mentioned the food. Uh, what was it, what did you normally eat, and where, where were your quarters? But first, what did you normally what eat ship? on the Comstock? On the Comstock? I was in the snipe quarters, engineering quarters. We were always close to the boiler rooms. And the engines, because I guess the idea was if something came up, we could get down there fast, you know, I don't know. The food, it was edible. Um, potatoes, rice, same as the GI food now. Um, SOS, plenty of that, which we didn't particularly go for. And I got introduced for the first time to Spam. Oh, really? Spam? Spam. What did you think of it? I love spam. I'm, I think I'm the only guy who still does. I have a spam sandwich every morning. Really? Yeah. All right. Now let, let's talk here for a moment about the uh, working conditions aboard the LST. It's um, you're down in the engine room, the boiler room, oh, and no. it's it's hot and it's a great deal of steam. As a matter of fact, a lot of people are not aware it was a dangerous location because if if a steam line bursts. It could do serious damage. You, you were in big trouble if you, if you didn't watch the, the water gauges. That was the whole idea of the water tender, was to watch the boiler gauges and to keep the boiler at the proper level of water. Otherwise, the darn thing could blow up, of course. Um, Did you used to have a wooden paddle that you'd walk around with to wave in front of uh, steam lines? No. No, we didn't have nothing like that. Yeah, that's my secondary thing in the boiler room. There were only three guys in the boiler room. Three in the three guys in that's the boiler room. Right. That's right. What were their jobs? Well, 
<laughs> we all interchanged, of course. Um, one guy was chains burners, mainly. That was his job. I would relieve him. Now, his, what was that job again? Change the burners. Change the burners. They were oil driven. The, okay. The boilers were oil driven. So we had to change frequently. Every four hours we changed the oil filters because of the crap in the oil. Mm -hmm. And then we had to change burners every time the ship decided to move at whatever speed they had. Uh, they set forth on the on the clock, you know mm -hmm. the engine or en engine order telegram. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, EOT. Yeah. And uh, it depended upon what speed came up on the clock, as what size burner went in. A uh, burner is nothing more than, or well, the burners are maybe about the length of this table. Okay, about uh, seven feet. Oh, roughly about that. Mm -hmm. And we had five burners. Five burners. Five burners. Two, three on the lower level, and two above, mid, mid, uh, mid level on the boiler. And you unscrew the, the top, the back, mm -hmm. pull the burner out. See, you had to shut it off, of course, shut off the oil on the valve, pull the burner out, and change the tip. Change the tip. Right. Uh, the end of the, the tube, or the, the burner itself, had a screw on okay. tip, and it had actually a, a little metal tip that was in there. In that metal plate was the whole size of the hole mm -hmm. that determined what size of amount of what amount of oil went in. So, if you were changing speed, you'd have to change. If you had you, to change the burners, right? Boy, that does that. How much time did that take? Well, you get down to doing it pretty fast. The two guys would change the burners if we had got a, a full steam. It would take two guys to change the burners. So one guy would change the lowers, one guy would change the upper, and they do it simultaneously. And uh, it's just a matter of habit. How long it would take, I have the biggest idea. I don't think the whole operation took any more than five minutes because we always had spare burners prepared. Okay. Uh, we'd have f five extra burners, and they would have the tips that we guessed they were going to use. If not, it was no big deal to take a wrench and knock off the tip of them and put a new plate in and put it back on. Now, this is very hot work, is it not? Uh, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you were, we weren't supposed to. We were supposed to be always fully dressed, but we never were. Meaning, uh, no shirt. No shirt. And nine out of ten times we were just in our skivvies because you you die as a sweat, that's all. And they didn't wear the, the uniform you're supposed to because if, if there was an accident, you know, you get less burns. Right. But uh, we didn't go, we didn't follow that. There was only one engine room on this LST? Two burners. Two, 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 two. two. One on each side of the ship. Okay. And LST is a landing ship dock. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many there are. I think there's only, I think at that time there were only two. Two. I know one went to the invasion of Europe. That was the LSD-2. Mm -hmm. And they were designed originally to carry tanks. Right. And they were supposed to bank back up ashore. They, that was the only really flat bottom ship that I knew of in the Navy. By the way, speaking of that, it was, uh, of course, the uh, the... Uh, Gator Navy, as it's also called, um, those those ships rocked and rolled a lot, did they not? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, they sure did. Yeah, because of their flat and the bottom was tapered so that it the, the, the deepest part was midship, and then it went back to the tail, to the tailgate itself, and it was only I don't know, maybe the, from the di from the deck to the to the lower keel, maybe it's only three feet in thick. Wow. It doesn't seem like much. That was a really quite a, a angle that the, the bottom of the ship was made at. The ultimate result was it was a lot of fun riding it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were you were uh, below you were down below deck, so we didn't have as much rock and rolling down there as you did up above. Uh, no. No, not not really. We got more pitch, went that way. 
uh, but as far as the role of the ship, no, that didn't affect us too much. The guys are above deck, they felt it, but not, not us too much. All right, now, what were your uh, working hours? What were your, uh, what was your... Uh, three hours on. Three hours on and three hours off. Well, normally, if I remember, it was three or four. I don't remember which. So you're constantly, you're either sleeping or you're working. Right. Or eating. Or yeah. eating, yeah. That's exactly right. All right. Um, you were aboard the USS Comstock. It's an LST. Yeah. Um, it's a very large ship. And you, and you 360 have, feet. And you're one of three in the engine room. All right. Boiler room. Boiler room. Um, what was it like with the rest of the shipmates? Did you did you spend much time with them? Oh, sure. We we're a crew. Right. Of course, we spent time together. Do you remember how many how many sailors were aboard the uh, the Comstock? Well, Approximately. Well, I can only go by our battle stations. I'm trying to think now. We had two. Six, eight. We had eight on my, I was, my battle station was a quad 40. I was the first loader. And I had, there was the, the guy on the crank below me. Mm -hmm. And then I had, I was the first loader. It was the second load used to pass me the ammunition. Mm -hmm. And then it was a guy who used to pass it to him. Let's talk about a quad 40. It's an anti-aircraft gun. Yeah. What, what, may, what's the term quad mean? Four, four. Four guns. Four guns. And what was involved in the ammunition? What do you mean by involved? How did, how, was it one, did you just put in one shell or did you oh, put... No, we put it in a rack. How many, do you remember how many, how many... Uh, seems to me there were five, if, if I'm not mistaken. Right. I think there were five in a... Well, it's like the bottom of a clip, like you, you mm -hmm. see in a rifle. The same just, thing. But you feed from above. You feed from above. Right. All right. Now, where was the Quad 40 located on the ship? Uh, we had uh, Quad 40 and two, one on each side of the bow. Okay. And on the bow itself was a 5-inch 38, mm -hmm. uh, which never, I guess our first loader on that, we never really used that too much. The Quad 40 is what we used. And then, I said it was a Quad 40. Then... Those twin twenties. There were three tubs behind us of, of uh, twin twenty millimeters. Shot, there's a machine. They were anti yeah. anti aircraft yeah. also. And then at that time, and when you got finished with them, you were midship, and just below, you, know, just, you took a drop down from the mid from the from the deck where the quads were. Mm -hmm. You took a drop down. And there was another quad 40 unit there, and I had two behind it, two 20 tubs behind that. On the stern, you had a tub of 20 millimeters on each side. Okay. Okay, so, so what I'm saying is one side of the ship was identical to the other. Mm -hmm. There's no two ways about that. Right. The only difference on the uh, starboard side was the the oil shack, which was used for, by the oil king to refuel the ship. That was the only difference as far as the structure itself. All right, now you um, you talked about general quarters. You 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 were involved in the invasion of Okinawa. Right. You were um, you were injured there. Mm -hmm. You spent a few weeks on the USS Hope. A hospital ship, then went back to the USS Comstock, mm -hmm. then on to uh, uh, China. Uh, that's right. That's right. Um, then from there, where did you go? Well, I got news for you. My enlistment was up. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, I had this house. Bear in mind, I'm a stupid kid. How old are you at this? About 17? I just turned 17. I just figured, well, I came over on a ship, I was going to sail in the Navy, and I did very little sailing in the Navy. <laughs> I ended up doing more walking through the mud with the Marines, so I was out of there. I decided, I'm going to re-up and make it a career, and I'm going to go into the Army Cavalry. And that's what I did. I went 
in the Army 1st Cavalry. All right, now I want to go back to something. When you were uh, on board ship before you went into the, the Army, uh, did you ever have to use, did you ever end up going to general quarters and having to use the Quad 40? Board ship? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. yeah we were attacked by a couple of Jap planes. And uh, I'll tell you the truth, I don't know if we shot them down or not. I know they went down, but I couldn't tell you if we shot them down or who, who hit what. I don't know. Right. But they went into the drink, that I know. <laughs> All right. Um, so you, your enlistment is up in the Navy. Mm. And you join the Army? I joined the Army. I, particularly, I wanted to go into the 1st Cavalry. Why the 1st Cavalry? Because I figured those guys ride. <laughs> Instead of walking like me, uh -huh. they were riding. And it was true. Now, where did you join the Army? When? Where? Oh, in Tokyo. Oh, really? So your, your enlistment is up? Uh, and, and they, they said, yeah, you want to go? And we'll take care of that. And they transferred me, and they sent me up to Tokyo. And that's where they were. First cavalry, MacArthur. And uh, what rank were you when you went into the uh, Army? Did they let you keep your rank from the Navy? I went from the, well, I was a third class in the Navy. And I went from there to being a buck sergeant. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, it was equivalent in those right. days to a buck sergeant, and I got assigned to a Sherman tank. We had a corporal as a driver, the jockey, me as a gunner, because I had the experience on the first loader, and our tank commander was a tech, mm -hmm. and uh, there's just three of us, that's all. Some guys sometimes had four, I don't know where the hell they put the fourth guy. But they had four, but we had three. So that's what was, that was it, and that's what we went into Korea with. How long had you been uh, out of the Navy? Uh, were you, you, did you go immediately from the Navy right into the Army? Right into the Army. And um, how long were you in Tokyo, and did you go through any kind of basic training? No. Okay. No, there wasn't any basic training at all. Um, we were familiarized ourselves with the equipment, that was about it. But you couldn't really call it basic training that I know of. Right. It was just a familiarization thing, that's about the size of it. I learned how to load a piece of artillery mm -hmm. and shove the shell forward, and that was about the size of it. All right, so you're serving in the 1st Cavalry under General MacArthur. Mm -hmm. That's right. And uh, suddenly Korea breaks out. Yeah, it was created, it broke out. That's, yeah, that's right. Now, what was it like? You're going from World War II. Uh, how much time did you have before you went back into theater? And, for example, in Tokyo. How, how long were you in Tokyo uh, getting familiar with the Army? Well, we went into Korea. It was a 70, no, 59, 50, must have been 49. 49. 49 and went to Korea because we went into the uh, Chosen Reservoir mm -hmm. uh, where I got hit again. <laughs> My whole unit got hit, hit then. But uh, I don't know what I was told else I can possibly tell you. I'll tell you one thing I firmly decided in the experiences that I've had that humanity is gone awry. Mm -hmm. uh, busy killing people you don't know, you don't see in many cases, most cases you don't see. You might see the movement of a bush or a shadow passing by and you take a pot shot if you're a rifleman. Um, but it's gone awry. We're killing each other for what? Really? And I've kind of delved a little bit in, in history since I've been out. And I can't find it in the records anywhere where there was a profitable war. No, I don't Not think one. so. I want to go back to World War II here for a second before we get yeah. back into Korea. When the, when the announcement came out that Japan was surrendering, mm. what was it like aboard your ship? And what was it like among oh, was happy. I was happy as hell because I, I had the opportunity to, to get aboard the Missouri. Oh, you were you went aboard the I Missouri. Went aboard the Missouri for the surrendering, and I was lined up 
like we all were. You know, I, a big, big deal. I was a third class. Wow. But behind me was a photographer for AP. And I had a little piece of crap paper, uh, camera mm -hmm. that I was going to take pictures with. And the AP photographer said, how about changing places with me when things get going nobody will notice? He says, I'd like to, you got a good spot and I'd like to get some good pictures. He says, I promise I'll send you the best one I got. So I made it, okay, sure, what the hell do I care? Didn't make any difference to me. I could see what we showed it. Mm -hmm. Where were you when, when you say you were lined up? Where where were you that you could see? Were you a, a, a above the decks? I was on the main deck. You were on the main deck, not far from the actual signing. No, actually those actors all line. Then there was the void space, nothing. The table where the the officers were. Jack, you were very close to hit. You were there at history. That's right. I was there, mm -hmm. and I got that picture. That AP did send me the picture. The same one that was published in the New York Times. Wow. I got it home in my my album. <laughs> what, what did you do after the signing? When you were aboard the Missouri. What, what, what took place after that? Well, I went back to the, to the Comstock. That's where I came from. I went back to it. Was there a lot of celebration? Uh, yeah, I guess you could say there was a considerable amount of celebration. We managed to get a little bit of hooch, mm -hmm. and uh, we drank quite a bit. As a matter of fact, I got stoned, <laughs> to be honest about it. But um, I think that was, it was a, I think it was a general feeling of re relief for everybody, including the Japanese. I really think it was just a sense that, thank God, it's over. We're not killing each other anymore. And that's, that was it. All right, after the signing in, uh, aboard the Missouri, you went back to the Comstock. Where did you, where did you, did you then go to uh, Tokyo? I went into Tokyo, right. And that's when I re-upped and went into the first, the seven, uh, first tower under, uh, under Mac. All right, real quickly on Korea. You were uh, aboard a, you were, you were, you were in a, um, <clears throat> Uh, a tank, Sherman. Sherman tank, and you were there at the Chowan, uh, Chowan, uh, Chosen, Chosen uh, River. Um, wh what happened there? What do you mean by what happened? You you got you got hit again. I did. The thing I remember the most was that we went in there, and it was winter, and we were wearing suntans, and we froze our ass. <clears throat> When you say suntans, light tan uniform that you see not wear. And the Chosan Reservoir uh, is that very high, high, high country? High. Well, yeah, I would say it's high. It's, it seems to be. It's with it all. Northern Korea is mountainous. Mountainous. And Chosan Reservoir, to me, was up pretty high. And I, I think that was by design. To be mm -hmm. honest about it for a gravitational pull of the right. water. I'm, I, I never sat down to figure it out, but All I right. think so. How, uh, you were injured there in, in the Chusan River, Ch I want to say Chusan. Chosen. Chosen River. Chusan. Chusan Reservoir. Uh, what, what happened? Where did you end up going? Oh um, my, I was going in with the rest of the, the units and they drive sprocket. Took a direct hit from a piece of artillery. Wow. It knocked our right track out. We couldn't do anything. We could go left. You could go left for the rest of, the rest of the time as much as you wanted, but you weren't going to make any right turns. And we picked up another show just above where the driver was. Mm. And we were dead in the water. So the tech said, let's get the hell out of here. And that's what we did. We got out, the tech got out, and I followed them out as fast as I could get out there. And the corp, who was the driver, he got out. He got hit on the way out. And 
That was the end, of, mm -hmm. as far as he was concerned. There were a couple of shells went off, and I got a piece of shrapnel into my back, knocked me on my tail, and the tech was, he was cut in half. Ooh. And that was, that was it. All right, where did you end up going from there? I obviously, back to field hospital. They took me on a, put me on a medevac on a helicopter. Mm -hmm. And took me out. And I went to a field hospital, I guess it was in the lower part. Like here, right. they made a movie called MASH. MASH unit. Same type of a thing. And they patched me up very well down there. And then the next thing I know, I was on an APA. I didn't go back to the unit. I went, came back stateside. And when I got stateside, it was 1950. I was, had decided, I was at that time, I'd been going with my wife for a year and a half. I had been seeing her. Mm -hmm. And we had more or less decided through the mail that if I ever got home, we were going to get married in December. Was this the first time you'd been home since you had left yeah. for for World War II? That's right. So you left in '44, right? Came to, home to in the, and came home in '50. Right. Actually, it was, came home at the very beginning of '50. Wow. Right after I got here, after children, and we decided we were going to get married in December, December the 30th. We decided upon. I was lucky enough to stay stationed right there, and I had 30 days come to me and leave, which I had accumulated. I didn't even realize how much leave I had built up, but I got 30 days. So I had time to prepare for the wedding, and I got the two-week honeymoon out of it. And I came back, and I went from there, coming back, I had a report to Fort Monmouth, which was in Jersey. Mm -hmm. Fort Monmouth put me in an ACMP unit. What's an ACMP unit? Army Corps of Military Police. Okay. And I was an ASU unit. And they transferred me out. And I went from there to Fort Sill. Cavalry base at that time and artillery, and then, and then, all of a sudden, I went into another MP unit out there, and all of a sudden, I said, "You guys are going to go out, go out," and they rounded up our platoon. There were 80 of us, and they sent us out to White Sands, New Mexico, and that's where I spent the rest of my time in White Sands. Wow. What were you doing there at White Sands? Yeah. Uh, just guarding the military well, police. Really? Uh, patrolling the base. And the biggest problem I had was keeping people out of the, the desert because the rattlesnakes were something else again. Really? And that was our, our biggest problem because White Sands has a federal highway goes right through it. Mm -hmm. And it's not open all the time. When the missile ranges were going to be utilized, we had to close them off. But of course, you had to get all the right. civilians off. But our biggest problem was keeping them out of the desert, to be mm -hmm. honest about it. Jack, I want to uh, wrap things up with you um, uh, regarding particularly World War II. And I know that you, were, you went on the honor flight back in uh, September, right? Yeah. Was that the first time you had been to the uh, World War II yeah. monument, memorial? Yeah, it was. It's the first time. What was it? Uh, you you were in the Navy. Um, the war comes to a conclusion. World War Two. Mm -hmm. You you are your enlistment is up in the Navy, but you decide you're going to go ahead and stay in the military and you yeah. join the Army. Right. What was it like for you um, when you came home following your your uh, with your Korean? Uh, theater being in Korea in the Chisan uh, Reservoir. What was it like for you when you came home? Uh, were you shocked at what you saw? I mean, was it surprising? Were you amazed uh, from what you had left in '44? Yeah, it was a well, it was a great deal. I went 
I went to service. The five of us went to service together. Two went to the Army and two went to the Marine Corps and I went into the Navy. Four of them didn't come home. Four of them did not come home? That's right. So you're the only one who did come home? Yeah. Two guys are still in Europe. And I'm not sure about the other two Marines, whether they, they ever came home and had ceremonies in the cemetery or not. I don't understand. Know. But they all lost their lives. They were, yeah. they were all killed. I, you know, it, it, not until really 2000 and then concluded in 2004, no World War II monument, and I know that, or memorial, and I know you, you were there. Yeah. Why was that? Where was it? What, no, why? Why no? No memorial. You had the why Korean. Have, you had the Korean monument. You had the Vietnam War memorial. Yeah. Why not until after all those? Why do you why think? Why didn't I go down? No. Why do, do you think there was no effort to build a World War II memorial? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I think maybe, maybe the people really wanted to forget of the, the brutality that was took place. I don't I really don't know, but I think that the people held back. Um, they would have liked everybody wanted to forget the war. I still want to forget the war. I don't like talking about the war. Thank you for doing it by the way. A lot of ways, a lot of things I don't re want to remember and Understood. I won't remember. Understood. But I think the people themselves, John Q and just wanted to forget it uh, as best they could. I, to when I had came home, and I had that 30 days, I went home and I visited the mothers of my friends, mm -hmm. and uh, that was hard. It was hard. Still hard today. It's very hard. Very hard. It's you know when you you grow up with kids, and um, and you you grew up fast. You were you were in you were seeing action at the age of sixteen and seventeen. Mm -hmm. That's why well, I wasn't unusual. The oldest guy I remember, and I met him aboard ship. He was thirty eight. He was and my God, I said, it's thirty eight years old. What are you doing in service? And he came from someplace down south and he said I'm in service because I got more clothes now than I ever had in my life wow because he came from a very I think he came from the Appalachia area I'm not sure mm -hmm. but he grew up with nothing and he came aboard and he hey I got all these clothes I got a couple of pair of shoes my god you know he felt real good, and I felt well for him, to be honest about it. I was a spoiled kid, as far as I was concerned. Um, my father was an engineer for the government. He worked out in uh, Chicago during those years in a little thing called the Manhattan Project. Oh, really? Yeah. And. Well, he kind of agreed with me. My mother had died in 1943. And he kind of agreed with me when I said, hey, I want to go into service. Come on a lot. They're going to ask me how old I am. I'm going to tell them I'm 70. So the old man said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll go on. and I'll back that. He didn't believe me. So they called my, <laughs> my father. My father. What's the matter with you? Can't you tell a 17-year-old when you see one? <laughs> and that was that. I got in. Now, your father was uh, was an engineer on the Manhattan Project? Yeah. Did you know that, what, did he ever tell you anything about the Manhattan Project? Only after the war. Only after the war. Was he working out of the University of Chicago? He was working in a laboratory which is, was underground. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure where it was. He never did tell me where it was. I got the feeling that it was under, under like Soldier's Field, a, a sports thing. I had, I got that feeling. I don't know if it's true or not. I never 
try to explore and find out. He lived in Joliet, which is a suburb of really, Chicago. Chicago. And he used to come in there. And he was there for, boy, I guess, maybe five years, six years. Because he retired, um, I don't remember what year, he'd been dead a good many years. But he died at 84, and he was, uh, he was very closed mouth about what Interesting. he was going on. Uh, we didn't talk too much uh, about that kind of thing. He kept a scrapbook for me as best he could. And um, that was a, nothing ever about what he did. Now, Jack, any brothers or sisters? Yeah, I have one brother who was in the Air Force. Um, older, younger? Older. Okay. He made 52 missions in an A-20 bomber. Where? From England in, into Germany. Germany. Oh, to Germany. Oh, yeah. Okay. But he was he was flying out of England. He got shot. Yeah. He got shot, shot down over the canal. Oh, channel. Channel. Mm -hmm. And he managed to get him out and repair him. <laughs> and uh, he he came home. He lived a normal life. He's gone too now. Um, I'm the only one left. Okay. Do you have any? Uh, just you and your brother. Yeah, I just asked since he was killed. Okay. Now, your brother was in the army with the Army Air Corps at the time. Right. Um, early on into the uh, into the conflict, right? He went in 1941. Okay. And so, was the fact that your brother was in in action uh, did that compel you to want to do so? Yeah, I think it did. Not that I think it was. Um, hey, my brother's doing it. What's wrong with me? Why can't I do it? You mm -hmm. know. I think that was part of it. I'm not sure, but I think so. All right, wrapping things up. You've seen the memorial, the World War II memorial. Mm -hmm. What's your thought of it? The most impressive memorial I saw, which really drove home what it was all about to me, was the Korean. Because you also fought in the Korean theater as well. Just I was good seeing those statues of those guys and ponchos. I know only too well what, what that was like. Uh, it just brought it all back to me. Which, I thought that was the greatest monument at all. The wall itself is a wall of... That's the Vietnam War. Just, just, a, right. just a wall of names on it. Right. People look at it today and they don't understand. No, I, I, I don't think, I should say they don't understand. They don't appreciate what these guys sacrifice. Well, Jack, I do appreciate your sacrifice and your contribution. Thank you very much. Don't, don't thank me. Say thanks and a little prayer. That's all. You've been listening to The War Files, a selection of interviews honoring our warriors of the greatest generation, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. The War Files is a talk station presentation.